Hey everyone, how's it going? And Happy New Year's. Today I want to do something a little bit more fun and talk about some of the most insane aircraft designs I have ever seen or am aware of. What exactly makes a design insane varies wildly. It can range from having a completely unconventional shape or body design to having an uncommon or unique engine or having incredible weaponry. It basically has to have something that really is on the fringes of standard design protocol and theory. I'll give an example for each listed category. For the unconventional shape or body design, we can go with something like the Vought V173 Flying Pancake, a bizarre all-wing circular plane with wingtip mounted engines. For the interesting powerhouse, I'll cheat a little bit, just because I want to mention this thing, and go with the Plymouth AA-2004, a plane that needed a powered wing to generate lift via the Magnus effect. Technically, the engine that powered the wing was normal, but the combo package of the two to create a powered rotating wing was certainly pretty insane. Lastly, for the incredible weaponry, I'll go with something like the Martin Baker Tank Buster, an anteater-looking design that housed a single 75 mil cannon in the nose for, as the name implies, anti-tank combat. All three of these designs are quite bizarre and bizarre in slightly different, if also overlapping ways. But today, I want to focus on a different design that's bizarre in all three of the listed categories, and probably more. A plane that had an insane body design. Less insane because of its general shape, but more so because of its combined shape and roll. A plane that also had an incredible powerhouse for this roll, and a plane that had an almost unmatched armament for its era. This is a plane that proves that the Curtis Wright Corporation was probably run by the criminally insane. This is the Curtis XP-71. The story of this masterful monstrosity begins in the early stages of World War II, before direct United States involvement, but after the German invasion of Poland. At this point, many a country, America included, were very concerned about long-range bombers, both their own use of them and enemy use of them. On one hand, there was the concern that Axis forces would be using high-altitude long-range bombers to just devastate allied cities, military bases, supply depots, and much, much more. Basically anything that was on the ground and could be considered a target. In essence, to borrow a phrase from former British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, the bomber will always get through. And so to counter what was expected to be a massive and devastating wave of enemy bombers, some fast, powerful, and high-flying heavy fighters would be needed to defend the homeland. On the other hand, though, Allied bombers that would be flying over Axis territory doing the exact same thing, attacking their civilian and military targets, those bombers too would always get through. But how many of them that would actually manage to get through was the bigger question. Enemy forces would also be flying their own bomber-destroying aircraft, and while some of your own bombers would still manage to slip through enemy defenses, Clearly, it would be more ideal if more of your own bombers would survive and manage to attack their targets. America's early solution to this problem was to outfit their bombers with just a whole bunch of machine guns and make Allied bomber formations a metaphorical spider's web or hornet's nest. At this time, due to America not being directly involved in the war, this concept hadn't really been tested in combat, but over in Europe, both the British and the Germans would discover much earlier than the Americans did that not having optimal escort fighter coverage 
was an incredible detriment to their bombers, with small single-engine fighters not having enough range to escort the bombers, and larger twin-engine heavy fighters not being maneuverable enough to defend them. Now likely aware of both of these issues that were being experienced by the British and the Germans, and also aware of America's current lack of optimal escort fighters, and also seeing America's lack of a high-powered bomber destroyer, Curtis Wright decided in April 1941 to submit a batch of privately made unsolicited design proposals, one of which was the model CW-26. The CW-26 was ideally to be able to fulfill both the role of bomber escort and bomber destroyer, with a very large frame, heavy armament, and amazing range, measuring in at a staggering 18.85 meters long, 25.07 meters wide, and 5.79 meters tall, the CW-26 was an absolute colossus of a heavy fighter, being dimensionally larger than medium bombers like the B-25 Mitchell and B-26 Marauder, with a gross weight of 39,950 pounds and a maximum weight of 46,950 pounds, it was also several thousand pounds heavier than either the B-25 or B-26, and it was almost double the weight of the A-20 Havoc. Curtis was basically proposing a new bomber design to protect their bombers. What made their design so heavy, though, was not only its size dimensionally, but its engines, its proposed armament, and its proposed range. With an internal fuel capacity of 1,940 gallons, Curtis was projecting a range of 3,000 miles. That fuel capacity was double that of the B-25. This incredible baseline range would allow the CW-26 to hang with just about any American bomber unit and provide escort cover for their entire mission. Helping to provide that cover would be an incredible armament of two 37mm cannons and a single 75mm cannon, all of them located in the nose. Each 37mm cannon would have 60 rounds per gun, and the 75mm would have 20 rounds. For the weight of all of these guns, each 37mm cannon weighed roughly 200 pounds, and the ammo would be about 120 pounds for each gun. So 640 pounds, at least, for the two 37mm cannons. Then the 75mm, depending on the exact model that they used, probably weighed anywhere from 600 to 1,000 pounds, and its 20 rounds likely weighed around 280 pounds. So all combined for all three guns and all of the ammo, it weighed anywhere from 1,520 to 1,920 pounds, at least. Then, making up another 7,000 pounds at least of the CW-26's weight would be its twin engines, both in a pusher-prop configuration with contra-rotating propellers on each of them, to move such a massive plane and give it a high top speed, only the very strongest engines they had available would work and so two Pratt & Whitney R4360 Wasp Majors with 3,500 horsepower apiece would be used, sat within two underwing nacelles to help improve engine cooling, large fans would be installed in the front of the nacelles to sort of suck air into it. With the large opening for the fans, the engine nacelles looked more like they contained jet thrusters rather than radial engines. With around 7,000 total horsepower, Curtis would project a top speed of 428 miles an hour, and they also predicted a relatively low landing speed of just 97 miles an hour. But also with the high power engines, 
they projected a service ceiling upwards of 40,000 feet and a climb to 25,000 feet in around 12 and a half minutes. As for the rest of the plane's design, a crew of two would sit next to each other under a bubble-style canopy in a pressurized cockpit. Behind them would be the high-set wings that also appeared to have a slight rearward sweep. The tail of the design looked relatively normal, all things considered, and the entire plane would rest on some tricycle landing gear. A bit more uncommon for the time, but with the pusher prop propellers, having the tricycle landing gear was absolutely necessary to keep the propellers off the ground. Now, surprisingly, even though this design was insane for a twin-engine heavy fighter, Curtis Wright wasn't just laughed out of the room when they submitted it. The U.S. Army actually showed some interest in the design, and ordered either in late October or November 1941 that two prototypes be constructed, under the new name of XP-71. The overall cost of the two prototypes was then determined in March the next year at $3.2 million. But by either of these dates, either November 1941 or March 1942, something had happened that showed that a plane like the XP-71 wouldn't really be all that effective. The Battle of Britain had taken place and Germany's very poor experience in using the BF-110 as a bomber escort had effectively proven that larger, heavy fighters would not be optimal for escort use. It showed that heavy fighters would not be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with smaller single-engine fighters, at least the heavy fighters seen in early World War II and judging by the sheer size and fuel capacity of the XP-71, clearly the main intent was for it to serve as an escort fighter. Clearly as well as Allied and Axis forces were learning, the XP-71 was almost guaranteed to be less agile than smaller fighters, and thus ineffective in its main intended role but I presume for its potential as a high-altitude interceptor, the Army was still interested in the design and gave them that $3.2 million contract regardless. Initial work on the two prototype XP-71s would be very, very, very slow, and that's also exactly what was expected by both Curtis and the U.S. Army. Because of its size, its powerful armament, and just the technology needed for such a large fighter, Curtis did not expect a prototype to be ready in under two years. It took until November 1942 for just a small-scale mock-up to be ready, and sometime shortly thereafter, a small-scale wind tunnel tester was then constructed. In early 1943, a nose section was constructed, with all three of the cannons installed, to see if this mock nose could handle the force of the 37mm and 75mm cannons. And that test was apparently a major failure, with the nose catastrophically failing under the combined force. This then necessitated a trip back to the drawing board to rework and strengthen the nose, thus delaying an already very drawn out, and now also kind of pointless project. As late 1943 approached, prototype construction more than likely hadn't even begun yet, with the small-scale testing clearly giving Curtis a lot of trouble. And by this time, the bomber-interceptor role that the XP-71 was likely still being pursued for wasn't really a concern anymore, and America didn't have any use for this kind of plane now. The threat of any kind of Axis bombing attack on the mainland United States was effectively non-existent. Both Japan and Germany were going more on the defensive, and at least as far as Allied military planners were concerned, 
those countries didn't have aircraft that were capable of reaching America. Allegedly, Germany did fly a bomber over America, and we're also working on the America Bomber Project, but the overall logistics of them actually doing this just meant that it wasn't really a threat. As a result, there was no real reason to continue pursuing the XP-71 project. And on August 26th, or October 23rd, 1943, after spending $2.3 million of the initial $3.2 million contract, the XP-71 was cancelled. Curtis did apparently try to resell the project as a sort of recon or anti-ship plane, but were unsuccessful in this attempt. So, as should come as a surprise to basically no one, the XP-71 failed. The ridiculously large heavy fighter, a super heavy fighter if you will, never even got the chance to fly and never even had a prototype made. But just for funsies, let's assume that they actually did make it, and it actually did fly. The absolute best case scenario would be for the XP-71 to perform pretty similarly to the Douglas A-26 Invader, a much smaller and lighter light bomber and ground attacker that was known for excellent performance. At its very best, there were reports of the A-26 fending off German BF-109 fighters, taking out more enemy fighters than they lost in their own bombers. If the XP-71 could somehow match the A-26, then maybe it could be viable. But the fact that it was also much larger dimensionally, and it was 12,000 pounds heavier gross, the XP-71 was kind of guaranteed to be inferior. Unless there was some kind of minor miracle, the XP-71 would never have been a viable fighter, and everybody involved in the project should have immediately recognized that and saved $2.3 million. But likely because of Curtis Wright having a pretty solid reputation at the time, and having a lot more street cred with the U.S. military due to pre-war and early war work, they probably got the benefit of the doubt here, which I guess means that street cred is worth at least $2.3 million. So I'm going to go outside and touch some grass and get some of that street cred. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. A shorter video this time, but, you know, holiday break, I guess I can call it. I hope everybody had a nice Christmas. I got a Lego Pac-Man arcade cabinet thing, and it looks very nice. The board on it actually kind of moves a little bit, too. You gotta, like, crank a handle. It doesn't work like an actual arcade cabinet, but I'm not entirely sure how you could do that out of Lego. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!